Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell. I'll be your host here tonight for tonight's conversation. We're doing something a bit different tonight. We're releasing a series of four presentations given at a symposia at the 2022 Tri-State Nutrition Conference. We're going to release those as four separate podcasts. The title of the symposium was Exploring In Utero Influences on Transgenerational Performance. The speakers and topics at the symposium were, we started off with Dr. Jack Britt. His title was called Epigenetics Will Change How We Manage Cattle. We then followed that with Dr. Jimena Laporta from the University of Wisconsin. Her talk was titled, Phenotypic and Molecular Signatures of Fetal Hypothermia. Then our third talk was given by Dr. Eric Capio. He's from Balchem Corporation. And his title was, The Growing Importance of Choline in Prenatal Human Nutrition. Then we had uh, batting cleanup was Dr. Pete Hansen from the University of Florida. His talk was titled, uh, methyl donors and epigenetic regulation of the early embryo. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome back our co-host, Dr. Clay Zimmerman. Clay, good to see you again. Good to see you, Scott. Thanks. All right. Thanks for coming along. Tonight's pubcast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit Balchem.com to learn more. Let's now go to Dr. Jack Britt as he explains that we are in the early stages of understanding epigenetics, and he looks into his crystal ball to give us the, uh, his view of what this may mean to the dairy industry. Epigenetics is a relatively new concept for us, and we're simply at the early stages of learning about epigenetics. It was first discovered, if you will, or talked about in, in the 1940s or so. Uh, but we're just now beginning to understand what happens and how it happens uh, in all species. And it's going to be an important aspect of what we do in the future in terms of managing our herds and flocks and, and resources. I want to point out that I don't work alone. There's a team of people shown on the bottom of this slide that is part of my team. We work together a lot. We've published papers together. We discuss issues. Uh, both that this is an international group, and so we learn from each other. Uh, what I'm really going to do is give an overview of epigenetics. I'm really not an epigeneticist. I don't know there's anyone who's an epigeneticist, Peter. Uh, but, but we're going to be talking about what I've learned and what others have learned in terms of epigenetics. The first thing I want to uh, indicate is there are two terms that you might hear, epigenetics and epigenomics. And it's not always been clear what they mean. So recently, NIH has a study group that focuses on epigenetics, and they say that we ought to use these two terms in this way. Epigenetics refers to changes in the genetic behavior, if you will, of an individual that can be transmitted to their offspring and to their offspring and to their offspring for at least multiple generations. Now, the DNA sequence hasn't changed, but the way the DNA behaves has changed with that epigenetic change. We also can have epigenomics, and that can refer to what happens in an individual animal as it develops, so that the genetic control of stem cells, let's say mammary, mammary gland cells, stem cells, or stem cells in the gut, may be affected differently and that may or may not be transmitted to the next generation. And we'll show you some examples of those. I think I'm a member of the DNA era. <laughs> and I say that because DNA, the structure of DNA, was published in 1953. And we built this dairy barn on our farm in 1953 in the spring, the same time 
that Watson and Crick published the structure of DNA. So I'm, a, I'm an early part of the DNA era, I would say. Uh, early on, if you look at the box on the bottom left, that was our concept of how DNA was translated and transcribed into proteins and how it worked. The earliest uh, understanding of this process resulted in a Nobel Prize. And it was pretty simple. DNA made RNA and RNA made a protein. And that's the way everything worked. We thought that all of the, all of the problems had been solved in understanding genetics. But then as time has moved on, we now know that it's much more complicated than that three steps. Uh, we have DNA, which, is, which is, has normally, as it normally has been uh, developed over the years or defined over the years. Uh, but we also have methylated DNA. We can have methyl groups on some of the residues of the DNA. And we have acetylated histones that the DNA is wrapped around in the nucleus. So these are structures that were, were not known in the early days, but they then influence how DNA functions. And then we have a whole group of, of RNAs, short RNAs, long RNAs, long non-coding RNAs that can play roles in genetic expression. Rather than making a protein, those RNAs may go back and bind to the DNA to regulate its expression. And so that's a step that is very important in understanding epigenetics. Some genes are expressed or not expressed. What we know that it is that essentially every gene is turned off in a normal process in the oocyte and sperm. And then those are turned back on. So epigenetics is really a process that works in development throughout life. Uh, but we haven't understood exactly how it might be altered or be irregular to cause effects until now. So expression of DNA can vary a lot in many ways. And uh, that's really what we talk about as we talk about epigenetics. Clay, Dr. Britt gave us an explanation of DNA methylation. Can you summarize that for us and then explain choline's role as a methyl donor? Sure. Yeah. So first of all, I thought Dr. Britt did an excellent job leading off this symposium, really setting up the topic of epigenetics of epigenetics um, for the audience. So essentially methylation is what, uh, DNA methylation is what uh, turns off or on the expression of, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the genes um, that are in DNA. So um, he used an example at the beginning, uh, near the beginning of the presentation saying that you know, in, in gametes, so, you know, whether it's an oocyst in a female or, or sperm in a male, that the, um, you know, the DNA is there, but the genes are turned off at that point. They're not being expressed at that point. You know, it's not until conception happens that, um, that, that DNA is methylated and genes, genes are turned on to be expressed at that point. So, um, you know, he utilized a number of examples to talk about epigenetic effects, but uh, he went through a number of examples explaining how, you know, that it's actually been 70 years now, which kind of amazes me. It's, it's been 70 years now since um, since Watson and, and, and Crick um, came up with, you know, the the. the the double helix structure of DNA. It's hard to believe it's been that long um, that that's been known now. But the, um, you know, we continue to learn more and more about, you know, about the whole sequence. You know, originally we thought, you know, DNA was, was you know, translated to mRNA and then the mRNA would build proteins. And that's a very sim simplistic view, but there's a lot that we're really just learning about 
methylation of DNA and, you know, how that, how that impacts gene expression. So, so choline, choline is a very key methyl donor um, in, in, in the mother. So choline actually contains three different methyl groups, uh, you know, unlike some other methyl donors that are out there. So, you know, it's, uh, choline is a very key source of, of methyl compounds for methyl do donation uh, to this, you know, to the mother for the developing fetus. And um, as we move through these talks, you know, as part of, part of the mini symposium, we'll learn more and more about this, how, how DNA methylation can play different roles uh, in, in, the, in the life cycle process. All right, thank you, Clay. Now let's get back to uh, the presentation. Dr. John Cole, who was at USDA and is now at, at USUS, put together a whole series of data uh, in the last couple of years looking at how various performance traits have changed uh, over the last 50 years. And he used 1957 as the base, and then he calculated, based on what we know about changes in DNA and management, what percentage increases over this the last 50 years have occurred to make milk production go up in the U.S. dairy herd. And you can see that about 24% of the improvement was associated with environment and management. And about 30% was associated with genetics. Those are pretty close, almost equal. About half of it genetics and about half of it environment and management. We would say right now that epigenetics falls that into that environment and management area rather than in the genetic area because it's caused by changes in the environment and how animals are treated or fed uh, or how they live. But in the future, as we understand it, we may move that up into the genetic area. It may become another a component of genetics in the future. So right now, we consider it to be an environmental factor or effect. But in the future, we may be measuring, monitoring epigenetics the same way, way we measure genes and, and genomic activity today. Now, one of the things that I want to point out to you is that any pregnant cow represents three generations at the same time. This is something I believe is very important for us to think about and remember. The cow is generation one. The fetus in the uterus is generation two. And the gametes in the ovaries or testes of that fetus is generation three. So while sometimes we think we're affecting the cow or maybe the cow and the calf, we may miss the idea that we're affecting three generations with an environmental impact. Think about epigenetics. We have to think about the fact that three ge generations can be affected by the same environmental factor that occurs. It could be a disease. It could be change in temperature. It could be change in feeding. It could be lots of different things that would induce that. But we do have in a pregnant animal, three generations represented. As I indicated, the oocyte and the sperm shown on the left, which are one in at that stage of development, are all the genes are turned off. And then after fertilization, some genes are turned on and they begin to develop and they develop the blastocyst, which begins to grow. Uh, in, the, in the uterus, oviductor uterus. And other genes are turned on to regulate the development of certain organs in the body. And that continues really throughout life. Development, repair, changes in our tissues. Not only do we have those changes in the development uh, for various parts of the body, but we can have changes in uh, the cells that form 
uh, the mammary cells or the or the uh, uter or the uh, intestinal cells, the cells that multiply and multiply and multiply over life, skin cells, for example, can also be affected. So we have various generations, if you will, and various types of cells that can be affected by uh, genetics and epigenetic turnover. Now, if we go with, to the DNA level, if we look at the level of DNA and we look at it chemically, we have begun to understand a little bit about what happens with epigenetics. The first thing that was really discovered was that some bases in the DNA have a methyl group attached to them. And there are enzymes that control that to put the methyl group on the DNA. And so it's not unusual to find methyl groups attached to the DNA. But when methyl groups are attached to the DNA, that changes the DNA expression. That's an epigenetic change. The DNA sequence hasn't changed, but that methyl group on one base can change how the DNA behaves. And then the, the DNA is wrapped around histone proteins, and some of the histone proteins can become acetylated. And when they're acetylated, that changes how the DNA can open up or unwind or unroll from the histones and become expressible. And so epigenetics is related to these two processes that happen uh, within the nucleus, uh, within the cell. One of the ways of studying epigenetics is, look at, is to look at identical twins early in life and late in life. This picture on the left is my twin brother and I when we were between three and four years old. Now, identical twins in their early life, by and large, are in the same environment. They're in the same family. They eat the same food. They're taken care of by the same people. They get the same medical care. But then they move apart. So my brother and I moved apart, worked in different areas after we got out of college. That's a picture of us on the right in Mexico working uh, with uh, some dairy herds there when we were 57 years old. So we had worked apart, if you will, for about 30 years at that time. My brother was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease uh, in his late 30s or early 40s. And he lived until four years ago. We were identical twins. Parkinson's disease is not a genetic disorder. But there's more and more evidence that Parkinson's disease is an epigenetic disorder. In fact, there are many papers being published in that area now. So this says something in his environment was different than something in my environment during most of our careers. We don't know what that is. People say, well, is it some medicine he used, or was it something he used in the clinic, or was it something he used to treat cows? We really don't know. But he obviously was living in a different environment than I was. And so that's an example of an epigenetic disease or effect uh, that has been demonstrated. A study in Spain is demonstrated in those boxes across the top. And they took identical twins from about four countries, and they measured the uh, markers on the DNA, the methylation of the DNA or the acetylation of the histones in those identical twins. And the red bars are twins that were always three years of age. And you can see the red bars are always exactly the same in the sets of twins. Now, the older bars were from twins that were 55 years of age. It's not the same, same individuals, but these older twins had lived apart for most of their life. And if you look at those blue bars, in every measure, the two twins are statistically different in terms of how that uh, particular acetylation 
or methylation had occurred in their DNA. So clearly there's evidence that over life, our DNA changes uh, through environmental influences without the DNA sequence changing at all. And so this results into what we refer to as epigenetic effects. One of the things that epigenetic effects do is to really keep the DNA from relaxing, if you will, and opening it up so that the, the enzymes, uh, the polymerases that act on the DNA to make RNA can, can function. And on the left, we would see what, what a normal helix of DNA might look like when it's opened up. Uh, on the right, we see what might be a helix after it's been affected by epigenetics. It simply doesn't have the, the wherewithal, if you will, to open the spiral open and for it to be expressed normally. And so this is a way that is something as simple as a methyl group or an acetyl group can change whether genes are expressed or not during life. Now when we start thinking about epigenetics, we have to think about activities that occur or changes that occur over a period of time. And I'll, I'll give you just a few examples here that we know of in dairy cattle that we expect are related to epigenetics, but we don't know the exact mechanisms yet. For example, if you milk fresh cows four times a day for the first three to four weeks of lactation, and then you go back to two times milking for the rest of lactation, they will produce more milk throughout the entire lactation, even though they're still they'll only being milked two times a day like the other cows for most of the lactation. So something happens to the mammary cells in that first three to four weeks when they're milked four times a day that influences the activity of the mammary cells for the rest of lactation. So that would be one example. We also know that if you have a greater loss in body condition score, body weight change, in the first three weeks after calving, that fertility is much lower out at 80 or 90 days when you breed the cow. So what is there between that first three weeks and what happens 90 days later, 80 days later? That would be epigenetics. We have pretty good data basically looking at genomic expectations and, and actual performance that if you do IVF or embryo transfer, uh, multiple ovulation and embryo transfer, uh, the, the embryo is not exactly the same as an embryo that is produced naturally. And when you go back and look at the numbers, they never quite reach what they would expect it to be based on our genetic equations. Heat stress, clearly uh, uh, one of our speakers and her team at, at Florida have, have worked, or when she was at Florida, worked on this. Uh, heat stress can not only affect the, 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 the pregnant animal, but the fetus and several subsequent generations. And we'll show you a little more data on that. There's some evidence that Fetal development in heifers, a heifer that's being uh, de developing in a heifer, uh, actually has better health than a heifer that is developing in a lactating cow. And, and probably that's related to the fact that in a lactating cow, the calf is competing with the udder for nutrients to be supplied through the feed. And, and body weight changes may be occurring. You may be subjected more to, uh, to body weight loss, for example, negative energy balance. So we have several examples in cattle that genetically are the same, but in terms of performance are different. Uh, let me talk a little bit about this observation that we made several years ago. It's referred to as the Brit hypothesis. 
we were looking at changes in body condition in Holstein cows. This was back in the, in, uh, in the 90s. And we simply took a group of cows. We had about 45 or 50 cows in this, in this batch of cows that were in a study. Uh, it, the pub, this was not published in the, pre, in, the, in the original paper, but we did the analysis later and published this. You notice we have two patterns of body weight change uh, in the cows, in the box in the center. One is fairly maintained. We just label that as maintained body condition score. And the other group you see lost significantly in body condition score during the first five or six weeks and then return back to almost the same as the other group by the eight to 10 weeks. And these cows were then inseminated about 85 days postpartum, artificial insemination without timed AI. And look at the difference in the fertility. The cows that maintained their body condition score had a 62% conception rate and those that lost weight and then regained the weight had a 25% conception rate. Out of the time of breeding, their body condition scores were almost identical, but they had different patterns in the postpartum period of how those body weight changes. And so we got to thinking about this and we, we then thought about that oocyte that is released at the time of ovulation out at 80 or 85 days has been growing for a while and we started working our way back it turns out that it takes an oocyte about 101 days from the time it's activated in the ovary to, to continue to grow in the follicle and to be ovulated so it can be inseminated, about 101 days. And so if you go out at 82 days or so and trace back, that oocyte that is ovulated at 82 days or so began its development during the transition period, during the time when the cow was losing most of its weight, the body weight changes in the transition period. So our theory was that it was uh, subjected to an impact through the granulosa cells that influenced its fertility. Uh, later on, a group at uh, Wisconsin it used data from two herds. Uh, there's about 1,800 cows in this study. They simply measured the body condition score change in the first three weeks after calving and they put them into three classes. They had cows that lost body condition score, cows that maintained body condition score, and cows that gained body condition score in the first three weeks after calving. The nutritionists there argued, we don't have any cows that don't lose weight uh, <laughs> after, after calving, but when they started looking at their data, their own data that they'd had for years, they realized that 20 or 30% of the cows don't lose any weight after calving. And these cows were all inseminated by timed AI at 82 days postpartum. And you can look at the differences in conception rate or fertility to that timed AI, 25%, 38%, 84%, which clearly shows that that oocyte out at 80 days or so has been influenced by the body weight changes just after calving. So that's an example of an epigenetic effect. Somehow that oocyte uh, has been impacted negatively. And what's interesting, if you go ahead and look at the rest of the studies that they did with this, those eggs are actually fertilized and begin to grow and all die before the fourth or fifth day after fertilization. So that means that, the, that their genetic development was impaired apparently by the heat stress or, or the body weight change stress that occurred much earlier. We, we see the same sort of thing with heat stress and other stresses in cattle. One of the questions that we have to ask, why do cows have to lose weight? And this is a study from Israel, uh, one of their big dairy centers, research centers. And these cows were all fed the same, and they simply monitored their body weight and their body condition. 
On the left, you see the percentage of body weight loss. This is natural loss, not caused by changes in diet. They were all feeding the same diet. And they, watched, they followed cows through five lactations. And you can see there's clearly two patterns of activity. Some cows lose a lot of weight. Some do not lose nearly as much weight. If you look at the milk production, it's the same. The cows that lose less weight produce more protein and more fat. So cows don't have to lose weight, or as much weight, if you will, to be as productive. On the right side is the fertility of these cows. And you can see that the low, the low losers, if you will, compared to the high losers, uh, were more fertile. They had fewer days open and higher first service conception rates. So again, an example of how an environment can change the performance of these cows. These are data from uh, Pete Hansen's group and, and others uh, looking at embryos. And on the left, we have the cumulative death rate of embryos during the, the first uh, six months after the embryo was, after uh, the calf was born. And these calves were produced by artificial insemination as the regular method or by in vitro production, uh, conventional or IVF uh, with sex semen or with mullet. And on the right, we have their performance, their milk yield, gestation length, so on and so forth. Now, you would expect that the embryos subjected to IVF and embryo transfer moet were better embryos because they're coming from the genetically the best cows. But they do not beat the controls when you look at milk yield. And so this means that their performance has somehow been impaired a bit by the way they've been handled in vitro. This doesn't mean we should stop doing moet in, in vitro fertilization, but clearly there's a difference between those embryos and embryos that are produced naturally. And so that would be another example of, uh, uh, of epigenetic effects. One way to deal with these uh, kinds of changes that we see is to have a mechanism so that we control or prevent those adverse effects. These are calves in a, a new calf facility at the University of Guelph. And they're doing something, I think, very intriguing here. You know, we typically wean calves at a certain day of age. But the calves that are weaned at a certain day of age are not gaining the same amount or eating the amount. And so what they've done is have an electronic milk feeder and an electronic uh, creep feeder for, for calf starter. All the calves have a, a tag, electronic tag, and the computer monitors their energy intake every day. And it makes the transition from milk to milk replacer uh, always result in them gaining weight. They don't have any ch uh, changes uh, or any weight changes that are, ga are losses because it, the computer is regulating really how much energy that comes in. And so this would, would be an example of how we could use technology to prevent some of the epigenetic effects that we might see. If you simply wing calves on the same day, uh, some are going to perform a whole lot different than others because of the differences in their natural intakes. And if you can make that intake not of just milk or grain, but of energy continue to increase, then you won't see this effect. These are data from uh, uh, the Florida study I mentioned earlier. Uh, on the left, we have cows that were either cooled or not cooled during the last 46 days of pregnancy. The last 46 days. And cooling was simply using uh, ventilation system, sprinklers, typical 
system for cooling cows. They weren't put in air, air conditioned buildings. They were simply cooled uh, during the last 46 days of gestation. The bottom chart on the left shows their, meal, their milk yield in the subsequent lactation depending on whether they were heat stressed or cooled. And you can see those cows that were cooled in the last 46 days produced more milk than those that were not cooled. We've always thought, you know, we're, the, the, the dry cow is okay, we don't have to worry about cooling, but now it looks like in a heat stressed environment we need to cool everything, the calves and cows and dry cows and all others. The, the next two boxes of graphs show the first three lactations and the calves that resulted from those cows. The next box over number three is the second generation. And what this shows is that over three lactations with the first generation and one lactation for the second generation, if, they're, if they came from the cooled line, if you will, the cool dams originally, they continue to produce more milk than if they came from the heat stress line. Now, every animal was cooled after that first uh, 46 days. All the calves were always cooled while they were pregnant. So this is a generational effect that goes back to heat stressed calves uh, three gener two or three generations earlier. It has continued from one generation to the next. Now the biggest challenge I think we have today is uh, how do we get data to measure epigenetics? Where's that data gonna come from? Uh, we really need to be measuring activity. We need to be measuring uh, body stress, heat stress, cool stress. We've, we've got a lot of tools to do that, but our biggest challenge is, is those tools don't talk to each other. How many different methods do we have of monitoring activity in cows? Or monitoring rumination in cows? Uh, or, or monitoring speed of milk production in cows? Anything that you want, want to talk about. We have lots of different tools, but there's not a consistent method. So we, we need to get the companies and the organizations and the breeders and the dairymen to start thinking about, can we develop a consistent activity score? You know, that's, it may be one, two, three, four, or one to five, low to high. But we need methods of measuring things in a way that we can compare that we don't have the data to do today. If we really want to understand epigenetics in the future, we need to know what the body temperature is in every herd every day. Uh, we probably need to know when the new silo was opened in that herd, or when the TMR was mixed for that herd, or we changed equipment in milking, or maybe even individual employees in milking. Uh, if we're gonna understand how these influence the genetic expression of the cow and, the, and her future calves. And so this is what really epigenetics is about. And uh, in 20 years from now, we will have uh, proofs in which epigenetics is used to estimate the uh, performance of the next generation. I want to thank you uh, for your opportunity to spend time with you. Remember, only the questions from lex this lecture will be on the on the exam. <laughs> so thank you very much. Tonight's last call question is brought to you by Nitrosure Precision Release Nitrogen. Nitrosure delivers a complete TMR for the rumen microbiome, helping you feed the microbes that feed your cows. To learn more about maximizing microbial protein output while reducing your carbon footprint, visit balcom.com slash nitrosure. Now, Clay, I, I think Dr. Britt was the, the, the perfect uh, lead off to this series. Uh, I thought he did a great job leading this off. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience? I thought he was the perfect lead off to this. I really, you know, I really enjoyed some of the examples that he shared uh, towards the end of the presentation on, uh, 
different examples of epigenetics in dairy cows, you know, ones that we think about often. It was a good lead into some of the other talk. One of his examples was the 4X milking of fresh cows and how that's affecting epigenetics as we, um, in very early lactation and, and taking those cows back, you know, to a 2X or 3X milking and the improved milk yield there. He talked quite a bit about, you know, increased body condition loss in very early lactation, you know, increased body condition loss, the first three weeks postpartum and how that can affect fertility 80 days postpartum. He talked about heat stress during late lactation. So heat stress, you know, the last six weeks prepartum in that dam and how that, how that affects um, the cow and the next two generations. Uh, which was a great lead into the, to the next speaker. Yeah, I found that very interesting. So there was, yeah. uh, I thought he did a great job setting this up. All right. Thank you, Clay. As always, it's been great having you here in the uh, co-pilot seat. To our audience, be sure to look for the next podcast in the series that'll come out next week. We'll be featuring Dr. Jimena Laporta and her presentation titled The Phenotypic and Molecular Signatures of Fetal Hyperthermia. And to our loyal listeners, as always, we want to thank you for joining us for tonight's conversation. We hope you learned something. I hope you had some fun. And we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.